Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, scientists, educators, social scientists, government leaders, politicians. Each will be one to one. Today, we address the mental health concerns of hundreds, if not thousands, of people affected by the events of September 11, 2001. Dr. Sudipta Varma, a psychiatrist, is medical director of the World Trade Center Mental Health Program Unit at the World Trade Center Health Care Center of NYU Bellevue Hospital Center. Each person who comes to the center with physical concerns is also evaluated by her unit. Her work seems to have no end in sight, as we'll discover. Welcome, Dr. Varma. Thank you. You know, just this morning, I was reading an article um, in the Newsday about um, a national study uh, which showed that people who watched the events, Americans who watched the events of 9-11 on television and were stressed out by them, uh, several years later had more um, heart problems, you know, uh, hypertension, those kinds of problems. And there's been a lot of uh, coverage of the physical problems resulting out of uh, 9-11, you know, the uh, respiratory problems of the uh, ground zero responders, uh, digestive problems, even some alleged links to cancer. In your view, have the mental health issues gotten short shrift? You know, I don't think so. I think that after 9-11, there was a lot of attention that was paid to the mental health of New Yorkers. I remember not being able to sit in any subway car without seeing a sign that says, are you stressed out? Do you have some concerns relating to 9-11? And here's a free toll-free number to call, 1-800-LIFE-NET. And this was a 24-hour toll-free service that was provided to people who may have had psychological or psychiatric problems. So. One interesting question that comes to my mind is not so much were adequate services provided, but were services utilized? Mm -hmm. And I think one of the toughest things when people are dealing with trauma is getting help right. for a variety of reasons. Sometimes people are just too caught up in the practical considerations. I mean, when the World Trade Center towers collapsed, we had one million tons of dust and debris spread throughout lower Manhattan. And so at that point, the first thing people are thinking of, oh my God, I need to clean my house, rather than, I may have depression or I may have post-traumatic stress disorder. So practical considerations of you know cleaning up the dust and debris, getting back to work, because we saw most people returned back to work within one week because offices were reopened, um, or dealing with funeral services or memorial services. So I think in the short term, a lot of people cope by getting back into life, which may not be a negative thing. But in the long term, if the mental health issues are not addressed by the people who are affected, it can be detrimental. In your view, how did 9-11, how has it affected the overall mental health of New Yorkers? You know, I think that one of the biggest um, results of the impact of the terrorist acts were having a collective sense of dread and fear, not only amongst New Yorkers, but I think as a nation as a whole. And that's sort of what terrorism is targeting, is sort of chipping away at the morale of people. And what we saw after 9-11 is that Terrorist acts or traumas or disasters are not just local events that affect individuals, that they affect a society as a whole. And what's interesting is that there was a study done just a few days after 9-11, about three to five days later, and random phone calls made to people throughout the country. And they found that 44% of people had at least one stress symptom related to 9-11. So you can have somebody sitting in Kansas who says, I was watching the events on TV and now I'm scared for my own life. Right. But you're not serving the people in Kansas no. or even people on the west side like me who mm -hmm. may have some stress. Who are the people who are eligible to come to your center? Okay, so the World Trade Center Environmental Health Care Center is a treatment program for people who have medical symptoms, as you said, related to 9-11, specifically Lower Manhattan. So we are seeing people who are either residents, area workers, cleanup workers, were involved in the rescue, recovery, or cleanup, and students. And there's a population of about 60,000 people south of Canal Street alone. And of course, we're not seeing all 60,000, but there are a lot of people who are living in the area, mostly in lower Manhattan, who are seeing. 
How long has the program been in operation, mm -hmm. and what was the genesis for it? Okay, so basically, Dr. Joan Reidman, this is this is her program, and in 2002, she was seeing people in the in her asthma clinic. She's also the director of asthma at Bellevue and NYU. And she was approached by several community coalitions, Beyond Ground Zero being one of them, and said, hey, we have a lot of people who are not being treated, and a program, a pilot program <coughs> was set up at that time. And then in 2005, there was official funding from the American Red Cross, and then in 2006, uh, the city poured in money. So the program, as we call it today, uh, officially began in 2006, but the work had been done even before that. And it's currently city funded. Exactly. Now, you have a couple of, in addition to the downtown center, you have mm -hmm. centers in Elmhurst, Queens, mm -hmm. and also, well, and also one in Chinatown. Mm -hmm. in how, how many people do you, have you seen? Mm -hmm. um, how many do you see a week, a month? Yeah. So the number of people that have been seen to date, so we're talking about since 2005 when right. the American Red Cross had put funding in, up until now, the numbers are roughly more than 1,800 patients that have been seen uh, and treated up to date. And each week there's about 150 to 200 phone calls that the program gets. And um, if the people are eligible based on certain criteria, a, a brief phone screening that people have physical symptoms and that they were in that area at the time, um, they come in and we have about, I would say, 100 to 200 visits of patients. And these are new patients, follow-ups, and it includes medical and mental health. That's each week? Each week, in, in the entire program. Okay. And what kinds of services do you provide? I mean, is it like going to uh, your therapist on the west side that you go once a week, or do you, do you, is it group therapy? What is it, what are you able to provide? So it's, it's interesting because one of the, the beauties I think of the program is that because it's a multidisciplinary program, we work very closely with the doctors, the internal medicine doctors, and we're all in the same hallway. So what happens is when the person comes in for the first visit, they're getting a whole battery of medical tests. At the same time, they're getting a mental health screening. So based on that mental health screening, we asked them some questions about depression, anxiety, what their job life was like after that, what about domestic violence, symptoms of substance abuse. And based on the results of a screening, if we feel that they have enough symptoms, we invite them back for an evaluation, at which time we decide what would be the best treatment for this person. And we offer individual therapy, group therapy, art therapy, soon to have yoga therapy, and psychiatric services. So each um, treatment plan is custom fit, designed for the patient, what the needs are. Some people are sicker than others. Some people may be in sort of an acute uh, crisis and meet, may need more immediate interventions, which may require them to see a psychiatrist in addition to a psychologist. Um, so it, it varies from case mm -hmm. to case. But these are all people who came in with physical problems first, with medical problems exactly. first, yeah. and were evaluated for mental health concerns. Exactly. What kinds of mental health problems are you seeing that are related to 9-11? So the biggest one is post-traumatic stress disorder. In addition to post-traumatic stress disorder, we see depression, panic disorder, anxiety, and substance abuse. But post-traumatic disorder is unique in the sense that it's one of the few psychiatric disorders that has a very clear link to an etiology, namely the, the trauma. And post-traumatic stress disorder is a very complex disorder that has um, biological and psychological symptoms. Um, it only develops in a subset of people. And so it's interesting to say, why do some people get this disorder and, and others don't? And there are many different factors that scientists are studying that may be related to genetics, may be related to certain brain chemistry. But one thing that we do know is that there are people who are at higher risk to developing the disorder. Um, women are at higher risk, people who have had previous psychiatric problems, people who have a family history of trauma, people who had perceived trauma themselves in their life at a period, previous time. And post-traumatic stress disorder has three main categories of symptoms. And in order to qualify in psychiatry as a disorder, it has to impair with your functioning. So we're seeing a lot of people who their main complaint is, I'm just not the person I used to be after 9-11. And that sounds kind of vague, but if you once you go into the evaluation, you're finding that these people are having difficulty sleeping at night, they're having images of 9-11, they're remembering things, some people witness bodies falling out, jumping out of the towers, um, people are having anger outbursts with their family, a lot of family problems, right. domestic violence. So 
you know, when you think of it, it's, you think of it as just being the individual, but I think that any kind of psychiatric illness is something that impacts the entire family, but not only that, but society as a whole, because there's economic consequences as well. So those are medical, emotion, medical and emotional problems that mm -hmm. seem to stem from the trauma of the event itself. Mm -hmm. Are there also emotional problems that stem from more concrete things like loss of jobs, loss of loved ones, you know, loss of a place to live? Yeah, totally, 100%. And actually, Cheryl, you raise a really good point because people who have all these concrete losses that you're mentioning actually are, are known to have higher rates of post-traumatic stress disorder. So if somebody lost a family member, if somebody was injured, and that's a big one, people who are injured, when we look at military and combat veterans, people who are injured in any kind of war or any kind of trauma end up having more post-traumatic stress disorder and depression and anxiety. And that's why it's so important to treat the patient as a whole. And one of the things that we offer at our program, as I mentioned again, this multidisciplinary approach, is that we try to also deal with their psychosocial needs. So we have a social worker who can help them with getting plugged into, let's say there might be some funding or there was round table assistances, um, getting an apartment, vocational rehab, we have art therapy. So really trying to get at the person from every different angle possible. So the treatment is, multimodal and right. inter interdisciplinary. So a person, you know, I know there are a lot of respiratory problems mm -hmm. as a result of, uh, particularly among the, uh, the, uh, the ground zero responders and people who lived in the area. Sure. So if you're somebody who's starting to have all of these uh, problems with breathing and, uh, you know, with digestion and you find that you can't work anymore, what, what's the fallout emotionally yeah you know I just think that you know if you if you've ever thought back to a day that you're sick I mean you just don't feel good you don't want to get up in the morning and mental health and physical health is so intimately connected because when somebody has these chronic problems I have a patient who came in and says I just have been feeling like crap for the last six years I used to be a marathon runner I used to work 18 hours a day I was very physically fit and now I can't breathe I can't you know climb a set of stairs without being short of breath I'm not who I physically used to be and he's a young man he's in his in 30s so I think that um, it puts a real toll on a person because you have a sense of self an image that you know I'm a healthy person I can do anything and I think all of us sometimes live in a bubble of this idea of I'm immortal and I think anytime there's a physical stress or impact it sort of brings to reality that wait a minute illness is part of life and dealing with that and accepting that I think for a lot of people is very difficult so I would imagine depression would be one of the things that you're dealing with a lot. Exactly, depression, yep. Depression, anxiety, and, and the medical problems also have concrete consequences, as you said. A lot of people who are sick can't return to work, and that's been a big problem, is that people who can't return to work, their sense of self is so tied in as being a professional, as right. a, a sense of mastery, and I think that's one of the hardest things for people to, to lose in their life, is that sense of accomplishment and meaning and purpose, and I think there's an interesting book um, called Man's Search for Meaning by Dr. Viktor Frankl, and he was a psychiatrist involved in the Holocaust, and he talks about this, the sense of purpose that's so important in people's life, and being able to find it, whether it be in a sunset or in a painting or with your children or with your family, being able to connect to something, I think, outside yourself, beyond yourself. Um, and I have a lot of patients who, even though they're not able to return to work, are able to find meaning and purpose in different ways, uh, particularly helping other people. And that is one of the key factors, I think, to getting better is going beyond yourself. Because illness, any type of illness, physical or mental, is very much self-engrossing and right. brings you back in. So I think the idea and part of rehabilitation and therapy is to bring the person back out. Mm -hmm. We're gonna take a short break. We'll be back in a moment. Everyone has friends. There's online friends. Friends to go out with on a Saturday night. Friends to hang out with and do nothing. Friends who show up on moving day. And then there are the friends who'll be there if someone is dealing with a mental illness. Are you one of those friends? Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy talking with Dr. Sudipta Varma, 
medical director of the World Trade Center Mental Health Program at the NYU Bellevue Hospital Center. Um, talk to me about some of the, I know you can't tell me the names of individual patients, but talk to me about some of the kinds of cases you have seen, uh, what they presented with, and how you were able to help them. Mm -hmm. So we have um, one patient that I can think of, and, and after a while, many of the stories have a lot of common features to them. So I'll present this one case. Um, this is a woman in her 40s who was working for a very powerful law firm. She was in the World Trade Center the day of the attacks and um, was at her office, and there was somebody screaming that a plane has hit, we need to get out of the towers. So people are running to the stairs, people are running to the elevators, there's mass frenzy. And she happens to get into one of the elevators that's just people are pushing and shoving, and um, she just remembers feeling like very claustrophobic and um, you know, just having some shortness of breath at that time. Never had any of these issues before. And the elevator, after going about five or six floors, gets stuck. So now she's trapped, suffocated, like, you know, sardines. And um, about 20 or 30 minutes later, finally the elevator opens, and they're able to find a set of stairs and get out. She gets um, caught up uh, with a crowd of people, gets trampled over. Eventually, somebody pushes her to the side so she doesn't get run over. Um, she may have hit her head a little bit, she says, and then she gets up and keeps running. And as she's running, she gets caught in the dust cloud. Eventually, she makes it over to the west side in their boats, and she gets back to New Jersey, where she lives. And she returns to her family, and she's a mother of three children. And a few months after that, nothing happened in the immediate um, events, but a few months afterwards, she finds herself not being able to sleep at night. That was one of the first symptoms. And she says that I'm up, I'm thinking about those people. I remember turning back and thinking, oh my God, they're not gonna live. And that keeps coming back over and over again in her head, this sort of survival guilt of why was I able to escape and not other people. And you often see that, like anytime there's loss, there's certain stages. Um, denial is one of them and uh, grief and loss and there are a lot of stages that people go through. And then she ended up having symptoms of depression and not wanting to leave her house. She was also scared of being in public situations. After being in that elevator and, and in that claustrophobic situation, she was always afraid that if I was to return to a crowded place, something like that could happen mm -hmm. again. When she was in a bus or train, she started having panic attacks. So this is a woman who was highly functioning, a powerful lawyer, who then went to becoming unemployed because she couldn't return back to work. Really? Yeah. She goes to work and she can't function. Um, she has difficulty with her concentration, with her memory. She's getting into fights with people. She's angry. She's irritable. She's having outbursts. And she's lost, like I mentioned, the sense of mastery that she once had in her mm -hmm. life. She doesn't seek help because she says, no, this is something I can do by myself, and really is in denial. And her family keeps saying, you're not the same person. Mom, you're getting mad for no reason. What's happened to you? So she comes to our program and she finds out about it in 2005, gets screened, and that's the first time that she had any contact with um, a mental health worker. And during the screening, when the questions are being asked, for the first time, she says, oh my God, I never realized that all these symptoms that I had actually fit and they have a name. Right. And it was very hard for her, I think, to accept that I may have a mental illness at least at that time. Right. And so we referred her for individual therapy. She um, uh, was in a group and eventually came to see me as a psychiatrist. She didn't want to be in any sort of medication management at the time, but she eventually agreed. And the combination of the therapy and the medication um, has helped her to the point where now she started going on interviews, she actually has a job, hasn't returned back to the same law mm -hmm. firm, but has returned back to a similar job, but a less stressful environment. And these services are free? These uh, services are free? Mm -hmm. The services are free in multiple different languages. Have you found that the kinds of mental health problems that you are seeing change the further you get away from 9-11? I think that as time goes on, people are developing more awareness and maybe more recognition. And I think that the biggest thing is knowing that there's a place to go to have help. And I think that that makes a big difference. The problems are different in the sense that people who may not have originally had any psychiatric problems now who have had concrete losses that you mentioned may have triggered some depression and anxiety because they've not been able to return to work or they may have been a small business owner in downtown right. Manhattan and weren't able to pick up business. So now we're developing as a result of that maybe depression and anxiety when they didn't have it to begin yeah. with. 
Now, this is a woman who was a lawyer. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of people, uh, you know, in, in, in the area who were restaurant workers, you know, people who weren't making much money to begin with and, 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 and then are out of work. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that they have more mental health problems than people who were financially better off? Yeah, I think so because one of the biggest things that you see um, as a risk factor is um, low socioeconomic status for um, a risk factor for PTSD and social support. And a lot of times when you see that there are people who are immigrants, they don't have the luxury of having a social support here. They don't have any family. And social support is, I can't stress how important it is as one of the protective factors for resilience right. and resistance to stress and not having either social support and economic um, means. And a lot of people who need help are not seeking it because they're very afraid that if they were to miss a day of work, they lose a day's pay. They don't have the luxury and they, they're uninsured. And so there's so many logistical barriers that exist to getting health care. Um, and immigration status is one of them. Financial means is another one. Language, transportation, and I think stigma. Mm -hmm. And a lot of minority cultures have a stigma about what it means to have to seek mental right. health care. There seem to be... Um a number of New Yorkers, and I guess uh, primarily people who seem to, who lost loved ones, mm -hmm. uh, lost people on 9-11, who aren't able, who just have not been able to let go of their anger, their despair, their depression, who seem to stay there and to a certain extent expect the city to stay there, I, you know, I, mm -hmm. you know I, I would say. Mm -hmm. What can you do as practitioners? Mm -hmm to help them move forward with their lives and not stay fixated on what can't be undone. Yeah. I think that grief and bereavement are normal reactions. And after a period of time, if they're interfering with a person's functioning, as we often see in complicated bereavement, I think that's when mental health workers need to step in and help people get over the loss. And through counseling, through education, I think that's the biggest piece, is to say that, listen, you've been through a lot, an acknowledgement of what people are going through. And supporting the phases, because they are phases, but at the same time to sort of gently accept and push the person forward. And in therapy, I think one of the types of therapy that we use is cognitive behavioral therapy. And cognitive behavioral therapy helps look at the way that people are, think, are thinking. And the thought is that there might be distorted ways that people are thinking that leads to depression and anxiety. And it's natural to feel all the things that you mentioned, to feel angry, to feel vulnerable, to be guilty, to feel ashamed when somebody has been exposed to trauma, to feel responsible. But then if you get stuck in these ways of thinking, that's when you end up having problems. So cognitive behavioral therapy therapy really helps you focus on getting unstuck by challenging some of those thoughts. So if I was working with a patient, um, I would say, so tell me a little bit about, you know, why do you feel that, you know, this, you're angry at the city or why do you feel that? And we go through and the, a lot of times you'll find that people have sort of all or no, nothing thinking that 9-11 can happen any, any time again. All people are bad all buses are unsafe, all trains are unsafe. And what we help them do is get unstuck to say, is it really true? What percentage of the time has do events like this occur? So having people look at the way they think can change the way they feel, which can change their behavior ultimately. Mm -hmm. Now, this kind of work, this is in your family, correct? How mm -hmm. did you get in, involved in this, in psychiatry? So I actually grew up in a family. Um, my father's a psychiatrist. Um, he has a background in child psychiatry and um, in addiction. And my mother has a uh, PhD in special education. So I always grew up in a family where we talked very intellectual. There were a lot of books in the house. And to me, psychiatry combines all the fields that I've been most fascinated about as a kid. You have the natural sciences, you have the biological sciences, and you have the social sciences. And it's a field that can combine everything from anthropology to sociology to biochemistry, neurology, and really allows you a chance to help other people and grow as a result of that. And I feel that no two days are the same. I love my job. I love talking to people. I love working with them. I love understanding human behavior, why we do what we do. And if I have a chance to give back as a result of the things that already invigorate me and excite me and that I'm passionate about, then I can't think of 
anything better I'd want to do. The psychological, the emotional fallout from 9-11, is mm -hmm. this an area that is being sufficiently addressed at this time? I think so. I think that a lot of attention is being given to the problems, medical and mental health related, and through programs such as ours, the World Trade Center Environmental Health Care Center, um, through the work that some of the people have done, Dr. Joan Reibman with um, some of our colleagues at Bellevue, uh, Dr. Eileen Cohen, Joel Gold, Gary Belkin, a lot of the people at Bellevue and the city and the community partners beyond Ground Zero have all really gotten together to say, okay, what is our mission statement? What is our goal? And we want to rehabilitate and get better. Because the goal of um, therapy is to improve the quality of life, improve resilience in people, decrease disability, and decrease comorbidity of different illnesses. So I think that these issues are being taken very seriously and that we're working with a team of very dedicated professionals who want to help people get better. And uh, Mayor Bloomberg's infusion, his decision to step forward and mm -hmm. come up with a, a large sum of money to mm -hmm. fund this was mm -hmm. really um, very helpful. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And also that, you know, the, they called forth for federal funding to say that, look, this is not just a city problem, but this mm -hmm. is an attack that has affected the entire nation. So we really need to come together. So I think that a lot of tension has been paid. And I I'm very impressed also and for, for you having me here today to be able to give light to the mental health problems and to say, hey, this is a problem and we want to acknowledge. Because I think that shows like this help decrease the stigma that's attached to mental health. What do you see as sort of the, 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 the long-term prognosis for the city in terms of this 9-11 mental fallout? Mm -hmm. I think that um, it's hard to say right now. One of the things that we're trying to do is collect a lot of information. Um, there was the World Trade Center Registry, which has more than 70,000 people enrolled in it. And it one is one of the largest registries or that have ever been collected in United States history. And now we plan to get data from you know the sur second sort of surveys. So I think time will only tell. But one of our hopes is for optimism. And that's one thing that I impart to my patients, to say that that we can only look forward and hope for the best. Right. Well, very interesting and a very important issue that, you know, I, I, I think could stand more uh, attention. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but we're out of time. My thanks to Dr. Sudipta Varma for joining us. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.